Well, thanks everyone for joining us for our third installment of the college admissions process uh, during COVID-19 and what you can be doing. Um, we're happy that you can join us um, as a reminder of, of how this works. Um, we are asking you to put your comments in the comments section and we will uh, call on them and um, have our experts answer them. And um, with that, uh, our first expert is our very own Dr. Rebecca Hill, who is an expert in college admissions. So Rebecca, thanks so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Lee. Um, okay, so let's start things off. Um, question that I think it's been on a lot of parents' mind. It's certainly been on my mind. Um, you know, I think historically, gap year uh, has been sort of a side thought that you haven't had a whole lot of students thinking about it. Um, and so it, it's, it's probably hasn't been a major concern for colleges. Mm -hmm. um, but with so much uncertainty in the, the, the next college admission season, um, what do we think is going to happen with gap years? And, and more specifically, are there going to be any restrictions placed on students taking gap years? Yes, thank you for that question, Lee. Um, gap year is something that, as you know, has gained a lot of momentum in the last decade. Uh, 20 years ago, it was extremely rare for a student to go on, on gap year unless they were doing some kind of service work or, or missionary work or something like that. Um, and now when we look at the highly selective colleges, they already budget for up to 10% of their incoming freshman class to not even be in attendance in that next fall because they're, they're, they're budgeting for those students to be on, on gap year. And students don't have to disclose that usually until they, they commit to the college. So that's not something that most colleges know until May, June. Um, this upcoming year, I can see many more college students or college bound students looking at gap year as a solution to potentially planning for another wave of COVID-19 or just wanting to get out there and, and, and explore something and, and do something different for one year before starting college. Um, do I see colleges trying to limit or curtail the number of students who won't be present on their, on their campus, which of course causes disruption to course planning, faculty hiring, knowing how many students can actually live in the residential halls. There's a, there's a whole lot of issues that happen when half of your freshman class doesn't show up. Um, so some of the solutions that colleges might have are charging a small tuition credit fee for not being present, but still holding your, your place. Um, so that way the university can still generate income. Um, obviously that has some issues of, of fairness because there are some people who are maybe taking gap year just to work and, and to save money. Um, so that's kind of counterproductive to that, to that whole claim there. Um, and then there are probably going to be some limitations to what qualifies as, a, as, as an educational gap year. Um, so if you're doing a service project or you're learning a foreign language or you're you know, working as an, an intern for a company for one year prior to starting college coursework, um, you may have to prove that you are with an organized program um, and that the, the duration is only for, for one year before the college allows you to, to take gap year or else they, they may reserve the right to have you fill out an application in the following fall to get back into the college. Um, and, and some of them actually currently do that. It's, uh, it's, it's not really a high stakes app. It's just something there to demonstrate that you are still interested, you are still committed and you still plan on attending college in the following fall. Um, but I would, I would probably not think of gap year as a sort of safety measure. You know, if, if you're worried about traveling to, to different states or even different countries to go to college within the next couple years because of public health issues, um, you, you, you probably want to be pretty realistic and, and see that what's happening in or what has happened in Italy or New York or uh, China can also happen here in um, Charlottesville. So I, I don't want to say that no one is uh, safe, but I do want to say that um, gap year um, shouldn't be used as just a, a sort of buffer time uh, to, to delay starting college because you're afraid of public health issues. If you do want to do gap year, and I, I, this is something that I think most students should, should consider at least, um, I think you should go into it with a very solid plan. What is it that you want to get out of gap year? 
What is it that you want to explore or learn or discover that you can't do in a traditional college freshman classroom? Um, and how is Gap Year going to contribute or add to your four years at a university? So it, it should be done consciously and uh, knowingly, and you should have some kind of rock solid plan for what it is that you want to get out of it. And that's, that seems like good advice, despite being in a pandemic, to just make sure there's some structure and the students have thought about the process throughout. So um, it, it sounds like the colleges that have already implemented these types of restrictions, it might have been for the best to make sure that students mm -hmm. wouldn't just be, you know, playing Fortnite for a year, right? That they were right. trying to, to collect some experiences that, that would, would benefit them. Um, I guess, though, it sounds like some of the colleges might be putting these restrictions in place to preserve enrollment numbers. Is that, mm -hmm. is that maybe the logic? That's, that's Most likely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we talked a little bit about this last week, but, but maybe, you can, um, maybe you can give us a little bit more detail on um, what colleges are going to be look, looking for this year. With so much um, spread in what schools were able to offer, especially large public schools and small private schools um, and some testing centers being open. How are colleges going to, to try to equilibrate that um, and what are they going to be looking for? That's a very good question, Lee. And the answer to that is, of course, some things are not going to change. Some things are going to be exactly the same as they've been for the last 50 years. And some things are going to radically change. So I guess let's first talk about the things that will be pretty consistent, um, things that we always prepared students for, which is you want to tell your, your personal story with excellent writing. You want your narrative to be unique, you want it to be growth focused, and you want it to have some kind of connection to the kind of person that you want to be, the, the, the kind of career that, that you want to be in 10 years from now. Um, so you want to have a really solid narrative. Um, second, you, you want to take the most difficult classes that your school or your, your counselor will, will allow you to, to, to take. Obviously, for the extremely high-level classes, the ones that are, are weighted, you often have to do a lot of prerequisite courses. Um, you might have to take placement tests, um, but you, you want to push yourself to take the most challenging coursework in core subject areas, and that's something that we, we, we call MESHL, or Math, English, science, history, and foreign languages. Um, so take the most difficult classes that you can handle in those, in those core areas. Um, and that's something that you're, you're probably doing with your, with your counselor, working out with your, with your teachers at your high school, planning for, for next year. Um, they're also gonna be looking for evidence that you have cultivated a personal and or professional self outside of just academic work. So did you hold a leadership role on a sports team? Did you do community service around a certain social issue? Did you display paintings at a local gallery? Um, did you learn how to crochet? What are the things that, that you did um, outside of traditional coursework that distinguish you and, and show that you're an interesting, curious person? Um, a lot of college is exploring who, who you are, taking classes that, that you never thought that you would like, um, and, and, being, and being challenged in them. And if that's not something that you're already doing now as a, as a high school student, um, moderately and highly selective colleges are going to look at you with a little bit of suspicion and say, well, does this person just like to follow rules? Or does this person just do what they're, what they're told? Or does this person follow their, their innate curiosity and try to learn as much as they possibly can. So those aspects of the application are not going to change. Those are very consistent and those are pretty good metrics in, in, de in determining whether a student is going to adapt to a particular college climate. Um, what is going to change this year is obviously end of year junior grades. Um, this is going to be a little bit difficult for universities to, to calculate and the good ones are probably going to do it on a high school by, by high school basis. Um, getting some information from your counselor about how junior year grades were actually calculated. Um, this has not been consistent in the, in the county, in the state, in, in the nation. Some students have still had to go to class via Zoom or via Google Hangouts for eight hours 
per day and other students have received maybe a packet of a couple of readings that they were supposed to complete by the end of the year. And in both of those cases, students may, may have gotten A's. So what does an A really mean? Um, so that's something that's gonna be, I think, extremely difficult for colleges to calculate, um, which is why I think first semester senior year grades are gonna be even more critical. So you, you wanna make sure that you're going into senior year without any gaps in, in your knowledge and without lag time. So that does mean you have to exercise your brain during the summer so that you're walking into senior year ready to just dominate those, those core classes because getting A's or, or even B, B pluses in, in those classes is gonna make a big difference in, in your, your eligibility for certain colleges. The other thing that has changed, obviously, and that we've talked about a lot is the standardized tests. Um, the SAT and, and the ACT, um, although some schools have completely nixed them from consideration, um, many schools still, still have them as an option. Um, and schools that are local to us, like UVA, uh, will still require a, a score this year. Now, will their requirements for a certain kind of score be the same as they were in, in years past? That's something that we don't yet know. Um, but for schools that have not um, erased the requirement for, for, for standardized tests, it does mean that students will still have to take them. And it's always a good rule of thumb to prepare for it. Um, but, but again, would a student in normal circumstances score a 1400, but in these circumstances get a you know, 1200? Will colleges recognize that? How will they calculate it? How, how will those scores be seen differently than they have in the past couple of years? Those are, those, those are questions we don't have answers to at this point. Um, we're still waiting for colleges to release that. Thanks so much, Rebecca. And there's, there's a lot sort of baked into that answer. And if I can uh, phrase it back to you, it sounds like um, maybe this summer, more, uh, more than any other summer, it, it's important to, to stay active um, and, and show that you can follow your passions um, and, and get a project completed. And you know, there, there, I think there's always been some concern, at least in my mind, that in some, in some projects, in some clubs, it takes resources to be active in those clubs. But it sounds like what you're telling me is that there are things that even you can do for free that can demonstrate, I can follow through with this, and I, I didn't need any resources. And that's really what colleges are looking for. Is, is that accurate? That's absolutely accurate. And just off of the top of my head, um, there are three resources that are extremely low cost and or free. Um, one is Coursera, and it's, it's an online program where you can, you can follow a lecture with all of the readings and the quizzes and, and, and the homework from a top level school in, in any class that you want to take. You don't earn college credit for it. You don't earn high school credit for it, but you do get to sample what college learning looks like. And you also get a certificate that you can upload to, to Common App. So there is proof that you have gone through all of the different hoops to get through a college level course. And it's, it's a great way to not only prepare for senior year classes. So let's, take, let's say you're, you're taking um, an, an, an AP history class next year. You probably wanna try a Coursera class that will not only prepare you for that class next year so that you're, you're, you're setting yourself up for success in that first term. But it will also help you kind of sample to see, is this something I might major in? Could I talk about my experience in this course in Common App to demonstrate that I am ready to become a history major? Um, so that's, that's one, one possibility. Those, those courses are pretty low cost. Um, you could also still register for courses at PVCC. Um, and because a lot of the course offerings are, are online, if the courses at PVCC are full, there's a whole network of community colleges within the states um, who also have classes open. Um, at, at PVCC, there was a term that just opened up in this last week, so it's probably too late to register for that. But there is another term, a seven-week term, that opens up on June 15th. So now would be the time to, to register for that. 
um, that will earn you college credit and you will get a chance to take a class with others who are of all age groups and all in all backgrounds. I think that could be really neat. Um, and that will look extremely good on your app because what you did while you were at home was you took college classes. That's that's pretty interesting. Now, if um, I can interject something yeah. now, would would something like Coursera have that same impact? Is that something that can appear on a college transcript mm -hmm. and has some impact? It will not be on a transcript. You will get a, a certificate of completion. Um, and if, if you are more of a social learner, I would recommend signing up for a, a course with your friends so that you can all work on it as a group versus you just looking at these college readings wondering, I don't understand half of these words, what do I do? Um, so. There, that, that won't have the same impact, but if you're a little nervous about taking a course that will be on your college transcript forever, because that's, that's what will happen, um, maybe that's a better option. It's lower stakes. Um, so college credit is, is permanent, so take it seriously. <laughs> um, and then the uh, last option is I, I know that some of the Virginia high schools are signing up with um, a virtual course, uh, a course series this summer. Um, that doesn't start for a couple weeks now, um, but if that's something that, that, that interests you where you can earn high school credits for classes that are typically offered during the summer or during the, the academic year and you wanna free up some space in your uh, schedule, and I always recommend if you can free up something in that fall term senior year when you are stressed out about college apps, that's the best time to possibly do it. You should be in, in touch with your, with your high school counselor um, who could help to register you for that. And I think the classes start at the end of June, but if it, if it is earlier, you probably wanna reach out now. Great, thanks so much. And that I think answers, Noel and Logan both had questions to that effect. Uh, Rosalind, thanks so much for chiming in. She's always got amazing questions. Um, she's asking, should students use social media to display their extracurricular activities and interact with prospective colleges? And mm -hmm. is this an effective way to demonstrate interest? Yeah, that's, that's, a, really, that's a really great question. Um, it, it really depends. If you have a social media channel where you mix personal life and a particular talent or hobby that you want to showcase for for academic reasons um, you just want to be very careful because what you're displaying is is public so if there is a distasteful picture of you doing something that you don't want colleges to see um, just realize that's all on the same channel it's all it's all public um, so if you want them to see you scoring a goal in you know hockey but then you, you have that picture right next to something that you probably don't want them to know about, then um, it's, 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 not, it's not the best strategy. Uh, what, many, what many high school students do, like if they, if they have a talent, like they're, they're an athlete or they, they dance or they're a performer, um, they usually create a separate channel just for that. And if, if you want to tag college is great. Um, they often don't look at those as carefully as students who reach out directly to colleges. So just, just tagging a college in your, in your post is, is not necessarily gonna, gonna get you on some kind of list. Um, that's very different for um, sports where there's you know, scouting and, and whatnot, but that usually starts in like ninth grade. So we're, we're talking like, you know, if, if, if you're a rising senior and you haven't been scouted yet, probably not gonna be scouted, <laughs> that's just how it works. Um, however, um, I would, I would do some research on the individual college and see what they consider as demonstrated interest. Some of the websites actually list like emailing so-and-so going to the tour. Um, and I know that they're all virtual, but you, you, you can still register for once talking to one of our current students. All of those things count as demonstrated interest. But then there's a whole host of colleges that don't look at that at all. Um, the trend is that liberal arts schools that are smaller and just have you know, capacity issues 
um, are incredibly selective and want students who understand what their particular setting is, is like. And if, if you are a, an active participant on their, their social media or you, you email them, that can mean a, a lot to the right college. But if you're looking at a big state school like Michigan or uh, Texas, I can guarantee you no one's even gonna see that. So do research on the, the individual college, see what they consider to be demonstrated interest, and then only do what they want you to do. Don't blindly send out emails to you know, faculty or uh, deans. They, don't, they generally don't like that. <laughs> and maybe a, a, a nice little nugget for, for all students is, don't put anything on your social media that you don't want a college to see at some point, because if exactly. they do enough digging, they can, they can always find it. Exactly. Uh, sort of a song, along those same lines, Tony asked a question, um, uh, would LinkedIn be an option for keeping a professional profile and, sure. and sort of tracking your professional accomplishments there? Um, or is that not something that's, that's generally used in um, higher ed applications? Um, I mean, if they, if they, if a college, if an admissions officer has some compelling reason to search for you, so you're, you're not necessarily going to put your LinkedIn website on, on Common App, um, but if there is some compelling reason for them to, you know, search for you, for instance, if you put something on your activities list, that seems just like so magnificent that they're kind of skeptical that it might not be true or it might be true that they, they might go, they, they, they might do a, a search on, you know, Google or LinkedIn, somewhere where people volunteer the, the information and it's usually vetted and it's, it's typically public um, to just fact check. So, I mean, it, it does look professional. I would, I mean, it's just, it's, it's a good thing to have if you're at the stage of, of high school where you're looking for an internship before you even start college. Um, so it's, it's good to start generating a, a small network. It's good to practice taking a professional photo. Um, and it's, it's good to start sort of crafting what your personal brand is because that's, that's gonna matter for not only getting into college, but also getting into scholarship programs or, or honors programs. Um, being part of a particular org or company. Um, so it's just, it's just something that you maybe want to practice with, but it's not going to make a huge difference in, in your application to college. Uh, well, Rebecca, there's a question that I had from some conversations with parents um, and a conversation with you. Um, it, it seems like some of the counselors right now are in a holding period to, to try to figure out what's happening um, with standardized tests and what the colleges are doing. Um, but that holding period is delaying getting started, but some of the colleges aren't delaying the mm -hmm. application um, uh, deadlines. So what, what's, what do you think is going to happen here? Is that going to put more stress on students? And uh, yeah. how long do you wait? Yeah, the, This is already like an extremely stressful process. And every year that I've been doing this, it only gets worse. And I, I'm sort of glad that we have all this perceived downtime to just stop and say, what is important to me in going to college? Or is going directly to a four-year college even the best option for me? Do I have more options? What are they? What makes the most sense? for longer term plans. And I, and I think with this and just like anything, um, you can work with your knowns now. So there's things that, you know, the, as, as I mentioned before, the colleges are still gonna look for. They're, they're still gonna be looking at your activities list. They're still gonna be looking at the high level courses that you pushed yourself to, to, to take and to rise to that challenge. Um, they are gonna be looking for ways that you have grown as a person outside of what your high school is telling you that you that you have to do just to graduate um, all of those things can be worked on now and regardless of what you do afterwards whether it's directly to college whether it's a highly selective college whether it's a, a local state school all of those things are just going to be good for your life so work on those things now and in terms of common app there are so many tedious little boxes like where is your car registered you know? <laughs> 
all of those things can be done now when things are a, a little bit slow because I, I anticipate even when school does open, um, there's gonna be this like confusion period where maybe we, we try to hold classes this way and it doesn't quite work, so we have to switch to this other system. Or we might do a like hybrid schooling where half the students stay at home, half of them come to, to class and the next day they end up switching. We don't know what that's gonna look like. I anticipate whatever it is, just because it's different, it's gonna be taxing. And why try to fill out college apps when you're already trying to just finish high school? Do that stuff now. Um, and getting some of the, the, the essays that are a bit more stationary, like personal essays, or why do I wanna to go to this school essay? All of those can also be written without knowing when the deadline will be, or if they're gonna take this test or they're gonna take that test. Work on your knowns now because things are not likely to be easier later. Um, we're, all gonna be have, we're all gonna have to be very flexible this year. And um, I, I, I think that students should really use this time wisely, not to panic, but just to say, this is what I can work on. This is what's gonna make me happy, like learning something new that I, that I like or that I, I think is, is interesting, all of that is gonna stack up and it's going to help you. It's gonna help you get into college, it's gonna help you find work, it's gonna help you discover what it is that you, that you wanna be doing. Um, so all of those things can be worked on now, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. And it sounds like the sort of summary from that is you will not be ever, well, you won't be penalized in this process for things out of your control. Right. So do things that are within your control because that's what the that's what they're going to calibrate on is that here's what you could have done and you did do that so we're yeah. it seems like we're, we're satisfied with that yeah um all right looks like we we have some questions coming in um herb thanks so much for for joining um uh this is an sat act question we'll break to those in in just a second um so another question is, um, is it better for students to show multiple projects or, or interests that they're involved in or just hyper-focus on one? And I know that's a loaded question, so answer <laughs> as best you can. Yeah, I mean, it, it, again, it really depends on what it is. If you're using these six months to learn how to play bass and trumpet and saxophone, yes, learn, learn how to do all of them um because they're, they're they're all they're all related and interlocked um if you are learning how to um look through a telescope and calculate the distance of a planet and you're also working on a like germ cell theory and you're also reading all of russian literature um you're probably you, there's probably too many things on your plate um, colleges are always looking for some kind of continuity between the things that you decide to do. Now, of, of course, we, we all have extremely different interests just because someone likes to play jazz doesn't prevent them from also wanting to do STEM, you know, so that it, it, it's, it's not to say that it's limiting you, but there should be some kind of connection. Um, and colleges also know when students have done a lot of things just to stay busy and just so their, their resume looks jam-packed. Um, being busy is neither a, a, a virtue nor a skill that colleges necessarily want. They want people who are busy with purpose. Um, so if you're, if you're looking at the spread of your different projects and, and you can't find any through line, they're all completely different and you're not really sure why you're doing them. Um, it's probably not even something that you'd be able to, to write about in a you know, personal statement or a, a short answer essay. Because if you're just doing things to stay busy, colleges see that. And, and also that, that's just very stressful. Um, if you're gonna lose your sense of time in a, in a really worthy project, keep it simple and keep it to something that you actually like. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess from a college's perspective, if it is, if it's scattered amongst a number of interests, either the student 
is not really finding things that they're passionate about and they're checking off boxes or if it's just one thing, the story sort of makes sense. And it's like, wow, this student is passionate about this. And so it makes sense that they would keep all of these interests in track, on, on track. So, Absolutely. Um, all right. So before we close the segment, uh, Rebecca, can you tell us what are, you know, we obviously think that, you know, one of the most productive ways to get through the application process is to have a practice hand. Um, mm-hmm. But in absence of that, what are some resources that parents can access to, to try to understand the myriad of mm-hmm. things required for college admissions? That's, that's a good question. Um, first and foremost, visit the prospective student page for the colleges that you're looking at. Um, no, no information is going to be as accurate and as timely as what, what the college is actually publishing. And I, I can't tell you how many students just skip that step because they feel like, like I'm supposed to know or Google is, is supposed to know. But oftentimes colleges tell you everything that you need, especially in this weird transition year, um, right on their, their own website. So first, always check that out. Um, second, there are two websites that I, I often reference that I, I think are just very good. Um, one is called Prep Scholar, um, and the other one is called College Vine. Um, College Vine and Prep Scholar are excellent resources if you are confused about how to approach essays from, from colleges that have just a whole list of supplemental prompts. And there seems to be overlap with some, but not, but not with others. Or some, they give you a, a choice of five and, and you can pick three, which are the best three. Um, that's, that's a great website for figuring out how to, how to approach college essays. Um, that's College Vine. Prep Scholar offers more holistic um, stats about what are the, the average test scores in, in, in the last decade for this this particular school, what what is the average grade point average, um, what classes will really help you stand out here. Great, thanks so much for those resources. And Rebecca, thank you so much again for your wealth of knowledge, just pouring it on us. You know, um, it's, it's great to always have you on, so thanks so much. You're very welcome, Lee. All right, well, thanks, Rebecca. We'll have Rebecca on again in a few weeks, and I um, will we'll see her then. Um, I'm going to have Scott Webster join us in, in just a minute. Just want to remind everyone, please like our page, share this feed with, with friends, um, and uh, just be on the lookout. We're going to be doing these as a continuing segment uh, just because uh, we get so many questions every time, and this world is always